And uh, based on that, we calculate the AVM score. Now, this score would tell us the likelihood of obliteration of the AVM with the use of gamma knife radio surgery. So gamma knife radio surgery, you need to understand it's a blind procedure. I'm not opening. I don't see the complete nidus. I am irradiating the area that is being seen on the imaging. And therefore, I need to know and to prognosticate my patient that this is the percentage of obliteration I'm expecting after the treatment. And therefore, I think that gamma knife radio surgery would be a good option for you. And therefore, this scoring system. So... Now, let me take you one by one through all the three steps. Surgery for avium, as I told you, is a highly technically demanding surgery. And uh, depending on the arterial input, the eloquence of the neurological structure, depending on the location of the uh, avium, not just based on the eloquent or non-eloquent, but is it located superficial or deep, and whether the presence of bleed or absence of bleed. The surgical outcome is determined by all these factors. And there are certain steps that we typically follow in uh, surgery. Uh, basically, broadly can be classified into eight steps. These are the images that I have picked up from seven AVMs of uh, Dr. Lawton's book. It's a beautifully written book on AVM. So you see, uh, triple S is the superior sagittal sinus here. Fox, which divides the two hemispheres, and this is the frontal lobe that you see here. Frontal lobe, the posterior half is being supplied by MCA. MCA is the middle cerebral artery. So that's the feeding artery. And this is the compact nidus. So one is the nidus. And then that there's a feed, that's the draining vein which drains into the superior sagittal sinus. So the subarachnoid dissection is the first step. And we need to understand what angle of attack I'm going to use in this patient. So whether I'm going to go perpendicular or parallel would depend on what is the depth of involvement of the AVM. So there is a free surface and there is a covert surface. Now, I look at the free surface. Free surface is a surface which is when I open the dura, when I remove the bone, open the dura, the nidus, the AVM vessels would lie right in front of me. That's a free surface. But the depth also has vessels. The depth also has nidus in it. So we need to determine how much amount of nidus is lying inside the brain parenchyma. That is what we see in the MRI. So subarachnoid dissections. And you'll see how I'm interpreting my angiographic findings into the brain. So you see why we need two views, the AP, the anterior posterior view, and the lateral view of the angiography would tell me the three-dimensional three-dimensional picture of the alien in the brain. And then I plan that this is how I need to go about it. What you need to understand is there is an artery, there is a vein, and there is an itis. Now, when you open the brain, you see the artery, you see the vein. It is very difficult to distinguish between an artery and the vein in the area because it is an arterialized vein, because there is a very high flow of blood that is going through that vein. So very difficult to determine. Now, if I occlude the vein before I occlude the artery, you understand what would happen. There is an inflow. There is no outflow. It's a very high pressure system. It will rupture. So I cannot occlude my draining vein before I occlude the supply. So the supply has to be cut off first and then the outflow. So the inflow has to be attacked first. And then the outflow of the avium has to be attacked. Subarachnoid dissection is carefully carried out along the AVM without touching the artery and without touching the vein. Now, identifying the draining vein is very, very important. So there is something called as primary vein and there is something called as secondary vein. Not very, what you need to understand from these two terms is the primary vein is the vein which is directly draining into the major sinus. Secondary vein is taking alternative routes and then draining into the sinus. As I told you, outflow cannot be blocked. But in certain cases, when it is difficult to go around the avium without sacrificing the vein, and you see the nature of the color of the vein changing as you proceed in the surgery, from red, it turns into blue. It is an indication that it's a secondary vein. There are certain surgical cases where you may sacrifice the secondary vein, but there is no way you can compromise on the primary vein. Now you understand the feeding arteries. 
So feeding artery is the one that I need to tackle before I tackle the vein. There are different types of feeding arteries that we have over here. One is the terminal artery. So the artery that directly arises, so one of the arteries which is arising from the middle cerebral artery going into the avium, ending out there. So that's a terminal artery. There is an artery that is a transit artery. Transit artery is the artery which arises from middle cerebral artery, for example. So it arises from middle cerebral artery, gives few branches to the avium nidus, and it also moves forward to provide drainage, provide blood to the normal parenchyma. So you cannot sacrifice this main branch, main artery, but you can definitely sacrifice the arteries that is directly pouring into the nidus. So that's the tr transit artery. There are certain perforator arteries that come from the brain parenchyma, small, minute perforators. They are less than a millimeter size uh, vessels that drain into the nidus. And then you have the bystander artery. Bystander artery is the artery which do not give any supply to the nidus. They just arise from the MCA, goes to the draining area of the normal brain parenchyma without giving any supply to the nidus. So you need to identify these vessels while sacrificing, while cutting off the inflow of to the nidus, you need to be careful. You cannot cut off the bystander. You cannot cut off the main transit artery. You need to tackle the perforator vessels very nicely, very carefully, because the perforators are the deep, small vessels, which has a tendency to go inside the brain part. They, they retract. They retract inside the brain parenchyma and may lead to hematoma later on. So pile dissection, here pile dissection is what I've been telling you again and again. So the paddle front as labeled by Dr. Lawton, you have to be very, very careful. Gradually, it's a gradual uh, millimeter by millimeter step wherein each feeding artery is tackled to the avium and shrink this uh, gradually we shrink the size of the avium and the veins start turning blue. What you also need to know and understand is the anatomy of the nidus. As I told you in one of the in the modified Stetzler Martin grading system, we have a compact nidus and we have a diffuse nidus. A compact nidus is shown in figure A. You see, uh, all the free defeating arteries, the draining veins are very closely packed with each other. And amongst the feeding arteries, you don't see the brain parenchyma uh, intertwining between the feeding arteries. However, in the diffuse uh, nidus, you see a lot of brain parenchyma that is coming in, not in the nidus, but in between the feeding arteries. So you understand as a logical uh, explanation to which of them would be easier to handle. Obviously, compact nidus is easier for me to tackle. And the route that we take is usually conical snugly fitting over the compact nidus and going into the depth. However, diffuse nidus is one of the nidus which is very difficult to treat in either way. So you understand that what is difficult to treat surgically may also be equally difficult to treat through embolization and may equally be difficult to treat through radiosurgery because of the diffuse margin that is present. Now, going on to the embolization. What I want you to see over here is the, if somebody could name the vessel of but uh, yes, um, this is the first vessel that I had asked. This is the main ICA branch. This is the MCA trunk that is going on. And you can see the nidus over here. OK, so this nidus, one of them, the one of the supplies through MCA, there is some other vessel that is being supplied, which is supplying this nidus. But obviously, it's not shown on this angiogram. And this is post embolization. So you can see the MCA vessel that is labeled over here and the ACA vessel that is labeled over here and the nidus. So this is what happens in embolization. We enter through the femoral artery. So I hope you know this anatomy. So we enter through the femoral artery, which would take us to the aorta, dorsal aorta, arch of aorta. Arch of aorta, you see the origin of the vessels, the great vessels of the brain. So you see the vertebral, you see the carotids. I'm not going into the details of their respective origins. Now, here I know an angiogram that I want to go to the middle cerebral artery. So obviously, I have to enter the internal cerebral artery. So I negotiate the internal cerebral artery 
once I negotiate the internal cerebral artery through a catheter, I will be taking this route. Internal cerebral artery, don't enter the ACA, you enter the MCA. Because you see that's one of the major feeding, that is the source of one of the major feeding arteries. So we enter through the MCA. And my catheter is taking all this route, all the curves over here. So this becomes technically very, very demanding uh, skill again. And once I have entered here, the embolizing material is introduced. Now, this embolizing material are available in different forms. It can be adhesive glues. It can be non-adhesive glues. It can be particulate matter. We have shifted to non-adhesive glue, that is onyx, which is most commonly used uh, at certain places. However, they still use adhesive glues. Adhesive glue would cause the catheter to stick. So once my catheter, let me show, take you to the next slide. Now, this is the this is the catheter that is there, the catheter that is there. And you can see the AVM nidus, right? Now you see the AVM nidus. Now this is the catheter there and my glue has been injected. You see how all the arteries, all the feeding arteries are filling up with the glue material over here. I hope you can appreciate that. So in this video. So the track that has been taken by the catheter, 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 you can see the loop that has been taken by the catheter, the catheter, the MCA terminal branches. And once the glue is injected, you see how the glue is tracking through all the vessels. All the, now, if it was an adhesive glue, it would be very difficult for me to withdraw the catheter after my procedure is over. Now, the point where we call the procedure is over is when we start seeing this backflow into the way we do not want so it is similar in embolization as well. We do not want to block the outflow before we have killed the inflow. So whenever the glue is injected, it is always into the arterial system and the arterial system is blocked and draining vein is the last thing to be blocked because we do not want re-bleed over there or normal pressure break through edema to, be, to happen. Now taking you to the radio surgery for radiums. Radio surgery is a is a very, very interesting and gratifying procedure. The problem with radio surgery is, okay, so first let me tell you what happens in radio surgery. Now, this is the nidus that is there. Now, again, I would want somebody to type the structure that you see over here in the midline, the structure that you see over here in the midline. For you, you need to understand for any surgery, your anatomy should be very, very clear in your mind. So nidus has been marked. You can see the midline structure. The yellow line that you now see is the shots that has been planned by us. To the, and the plan has been submitted to the machine. Almost 94% of the nidus have been covered in the plan. 25 grays is the radiation that is delivered. And uh, this is almost after three hours of follow-up that you see the nidus has disappeared here. So, uh, this is a very gratifying procedure. You can see the old hematoma, which is also resolved with time. And the nidus is almost completely disappeared. Uh, there are problems with the radio surgery. The most important problem is that it does not give an immediate effect. Like surgery, when you have resected the AVM out, when you have rolled out the AVM, you know it is out and it is gone immediately on table. Embolization, when I have injected the glue, I know it is gone. Right. For radio surgery, it takes minimum of six months to act. We have seen the results. Generally, the report says that literature says it takes two to four years for the AVM nidus to obliterate. However, with the dose that we're using, we have seen the obliteration to occur even at six months to one year time. But yes, there is a latency period. We call that as latency period, wherein the risk of re-rupture of these AVMs remains as before gamma knife. So when I have like, suppose today I have delivered my gamma knife radiation to the patient. For next six months, the patient has, uh, patient is to be assumed that he has not been treated. Unless obliteration has happened, he has a chance of rebleeding. So that latency period is there. So when I see that the patient is a high risk, like a young patient with a past history of bleed with a superficial AVM, which can be surgically removed with a uh, with an intranidal aneurysm. Again, that's a uh, that's a marker for chances of rebleed. 
uh, those are the factors which will tell me they are not very good candidates for uh, re primary gamma knife radio surgery. Yet, these patients can, the high flow shunt system in these patients, so that aneurysm in this patient or the leaking point can be dealt with embolization and the rest of the AVM nidus can be dealt with gamma knife radio surgery. So, uh, Interestingly, there is a group of patients. Now, we have discussed the spetzler martin grapes, right? Now, uh, this is the scan of a patient with a nidus of almost uh, 14 cc's. And uh, again, I would want you to identify the vessel again and again. You need to focus because for AVM, you need to understand that this is the ICA, this bifurcation, the two terminal branches. You see the ACA. You see the uh, MCA and major feeders coming from MCA. Some of the feeders may be coming from ACA, anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral artery both. This is the anterior posterior view that you are seeing over here. We need to also have the lateral view. So this patient has been treated with gamma nidus with a good follow-up and a complete obliteration of the AVM nidus over here. But the grade three AVMs, Grade 3 AVMs, as described by Spetzler Martin Grade, are a very complex uh, entity to be treated. Now, you understand that he has taken three things into consideration size of the AVM. What are the other two factors? I, I wish we were uh, sitting together um, face to face. I would have understood that you are understanding what I'm talking about. So, he spoke about size of the AVM, the eloquence, and the venous drainage. So there can be an AVM with a small size, so grade uh, small size score one, with draining into deep venous system and having and lying in the eloquent area. So that becomes grade three AVM, right? Small size nidus, draining into deep venous system and located in the eloquent area. Versus there is a large diffuse nidus draining into the superficial system, lying in the eloquent area. Again, this is also grade three. So both of them are grade three AVMs. And the management protocol has to be chosen wisely based on their presentation. Just to take you through a case and to make you understand the complexity of the AVM. So this is a patient, 25 years old male, presented with left parietal occipital AVM. So now this patient had bled. This patient was then embolized. You see the cast present over here in the month of March. But there was a residual AVM in this patient. Now, since the patient had bled and is a young patient, there is a high risk of bleeding. So we don't want to leave the residue behind. So for the residual AVM, the gamma knife radio surgery was planned. And a dose of 25 grades was delivered to cover 96% of, of the nidus. And uh, the RBS score was 2.4. The scan, the MRI brain shows the radiation changes. You see the amount of radiation necrosis and edema caused by gamma knife radiation. And yet the DSA shows complete obliteration of the nidus. And you see beautifully seen vessels with the cast present over here with no nidus present. And two years down, five years down the lane, the patient again presented with headache and decreased vision. And you can see there is a secondary bleed present in the patient. So this is a classic example where the nidus has regrown maybe a part of nidus which was not picked up on the imaging and has regrown and has become again a high flow system and DS again shows residual. So you see it's a complex structure, the dynamic process. It can grow, remodel, rupture or regress. The basic of surgery still remains as grades one and two are offered microsurgery, deep seated AVMs and Spetzler Martin grade three AVMs are offered combined therapy. So embolization plus radio surgery, embolization plus microsurgery, radio surgery plus microsurgery are the treatment options that we have. Grade four and five AVMs generally present with seizures and therefore the treatment recommended for these patients is conservative. However, there are certain modifications in the management protocol these days, and I think uh, that would be a huge chapter to touch upon. You just need to understand when you're dealing with AVMs that you need to choose your battles wisely. It can be very, very challenging surgical procedure. Thank you. Thank you so, so much.
thank you so much informative sessions we got to learn so much about the neurosurgical aspect the how much detail and how complicated it is um i would like to thank all our speakers to to have taken the time out from their busy schedules and being a part of our event um i will hand over to dr uh, to dr to bhavya she is the founding president of the neurosurgical club india for the conclusion remarks bhavya thank you radhika thank you so much um thank you so much dr rohini dr gwen and dr shweta for being here with us today and uh, the biggest reason that why we were wanting to have this session was not just because that we had three powerful women on board with us but also that we wanted to make it more um fruitful for our audiences for the medical students to also learn from it so the biggest reason that why we wanted to do this event was to commemorate the women neuroscientists who are a pioneers in this field and who not only are young but also doing such an amazing work and inspiring us young women all over the globe um i give hearty thanks and congratulations to dr rohini gwen and dr shweta for being here with us today and uh, Also I would like to inform the audience that we would be having a post event questionnaire so if you're watching this over YouTube live we will be sharing the questionnaire over the YouTube chat itself so don't forget to fill that to be eligible for an attendance certificate and if you have if we have any questions at all I think we would be taking it over the emails that we would forward to our three speakers because this is being broadcast live over YouTube so we won't be having the audience here with us but it would be seen live um till then i would again like to thank um dr rohini dr gwen and dr shweta for being here with us today and i would also like to thank my entire team for helping out to um organize this event at such a short notice and uh thank you everybody till then stay safe and have a good night bye bye bye